gliders and sailplanes, a fond look back at the golden age of soaring. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We have a very special episode today. I was going to call this sailplanes, and I suddenly realized that I'm standing next to a 1966 Swiss Pilatus B4 sport sailplane. Uh, in its day, quite a nice machine, uh, but we used cameras and barographs to record our altitude and locations for badge flights and record flights. And I suddenly realized that I can't really call the sailplanes in today's world when a, a high performance sailplane looks more like this. This is the German DG 1000. This is an all composite structure, a high performance machine, uh, L over D of 46 to one. L over D stands for lift to drag ratio. That's the number of feet forward for every foot of altitude that the altitude uh, that the uh, sailplane is descending. And uh, so again, this is a top end machine, uh, about $250,000 sailplane. Uh, the grid that you see just aft of the rear cockpit uh, is a solar panel uh, to charge the lithium batteries that power the flight uh, computer, uh, the GPS system. And the, uh, there are even modern sailplanes today with a fully digital flight control system. So with that in mind, I've renamed the uh, episode Vintage Sailplanes. And we're going to look back at uh, some of the really great airplanes from the 1950s to the 1980s. Uh, many of which I had the privilege of flying. I started flying when I was 16 years old. I was working on a private single engine land uh, rating and uh, wound up uh, joining the Air Force. And during that time in 1968, I saw a movie with this guy, Steve McQueen. It was entitled uh, Thomas Crown Affair. And McQueen uh, played a character of, uh, in uh, New England who was flying his own uh, Schweitzer 123. And uh, Windmills of Your Mind was the song, Academy Award winning song that year out of the movie. Uh, he was doing loops and acro and uh, cruising around for what seemed like an amazing amount of time without an engine. And uh, Lands on the Grass, uh, there's filmed this at Salem, New Hampshire. And of course, uh, his beautiful girlfriend uh, drives out in a Cadillac uh, to meet him out on the runway. And I just remember, I, I want to do this. I want to be that guy. So uh, I relocated to California after the Air Force and uh, got into soaring in a big way uh, and got my private and commercial in uh, gliders. And uh, when I landed on the grass, the only guy that ever came out to meet me was the line boy in an old uh, beat up uh, Ford pickup truck. But uh, flying the sailplanes was really, uh, really neat. I was just never as cool as uh, Steve McQueen. Uh, in my student days, I, you know, being an artist, I always had a sketch pad and full disclosure, I did not make this drawing flying the air while I was flying the airplane and no gliders were harmed in the making of this video. But uh, uh, this was just kind of my, my view of the, the early student days trying to keep the yaw string up there on the on the pitot mast at the top and the, the rope uh, straight and uh, uh, keep the instruments where they're supposed to be and it's just all hands and feet and uh, you know, speed will need an air balls. And anybody who's done this, I'm sure you're sitting there nodding your head going, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a uh, character building to say the least. But uh, I flew most of the sailplane training is in this uh, fantastic machine. This is the Schweitzer uh, 233. Schweitzer companies up in Elmira, New York, and um, the, the cradle of soaring in the United States. The 233 is kind of the Cessna 150 of sailplanes. It's a uh, rugged, uh, easy to fly, uh, great trainer. And you notice that the uh, uh, pilot uh, looks rather young and that's because this uh, photo was taken on his 14th birthday when he was making his first solo in the airplane. Uh, in uh, gliders, you can solo at 14 and power at 16. And um, uh, that's kind of the you know ground zero for becoming a glider pilot. Next step up the ladder, the Schweitzer 126. And I should mention that the all the numerology here, the designations refer to uh, the, uh, the first digit being the number of seats in the airplane and the last two digits being the model. So this was a single seat 126, uh, first flown in 1954. Uh, they built about 700 of these airplanes, including uh, kits that were sold. And it was just a nice little competition uh, sailplane. Uh, and you see it's flying out over the ocean uh, you think most sailplanes are flying over the desert, but uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, later versions of the 126 had metal construction. Uh, this is the 126D, the E model was all metal. And uh, this is a painting that I did of a 
126 over my home base of uh, Elsinore, Lake Elsinore, California. This is Skylar Glider Port as it appeared in the early 1970s. Uh, the next Schweitzer uh, up the uh, ladder uh, is the 134. And this is a, uh, a higher performance airplane, has an L over D of 33 to one. Uh, the trainer by comparison had an L over D of 22 to one. And about 100 134s were built, first flew in 1969. Uh, this photo was taken at the Black Forest Glider Port in Colorado Springs uh, near uh, Pikes Peak, a, a stunningly beautiful place to fly. And of course you always wanna park your glider next to the gas pump. And then we have the uh, Czechoslovakian all metal fully aerobatic Blahnik L-13. Uh, this uh, first flew in 1956, uh, classic design. Uh, they built them up through 1978 and uh, believe it or not, more than 3000 Blahniks were built and are flown uh, all over the world. Um, it has an L over D of 28 to one, it's two seater. And uh, as I said, fully aerobatic. And I fell in love with this airplane. And so I decided to, uh, to buy one. My first uh, glider was the, uh, the Blahnik that you see here. And I always look at this photo and, and think to myself, would you buy a used sailplane from this man? Um, again, always with the sketch pad, uh, I named this airplane Thelma Lou. Uh, and this was based on a Jonathan Winters routine. If uh, you're old enough to remember who Jonathan Winters was, great comedian. Uh, back in the day. And uh, he talked about Thelma Lou Ebersberger, the first woman pilot. Uh, and she uh, flew by uh, scotch taping 100 pigeons to her arms and, uh, and, you know, wrote into the history books. So I decided Thelma Lou would be the name of my, my glider. And I wound up as a commercial pilot at uh, Skylark Glider Port. Uh, the gentleman you see on the left is Rick Johnson, my partner in crime, uh, and uh, uh, Blonick Ace. Uh, between the two of us, we have given, uh, we gave out there at uh, Skylark uh, well over 2,000 sailplane rides. Uh, and uh, we took everything from uh, everybody from seven or eight year old kids to 70 or 80 year old uh, uh, grandparents. And uh, I don't know who had more fun, us or, or the passengers, but it was just a, a wonderful uh, experience sharing uh, soaring with uh, folks that had never done it before. So uh, we cleaned the canopy there. And so let's uh, climb in and, and we'll go for a ride in a Blahnik. Uh, this is a good tow position on takeoff at Lake Elsinore. You always wanna stay uh, right about there, uh, not get too high behind the tow plane. Uh, the rope is nice and straight. The uh, glider lifts off at about 40 uh, miles per hour and the uh, tow plane lifts off about 60. Uh, so you're airborne first and you follow the uh, tow up to uh, lift or the ridge or wherever he's going to take you to uh, begin your soaring. I can't say enough about the Blonick. The workmanship was, uh, was stunning. Uh, the Russian Air Force used them as trainers. As you can see here, the visibility is like sitting inside a fishbowl. It's beautiful. Uh, two instrument panels and um, uh, just buttery smooth on the controls. It had a VNE, a top speed of 139 knots and a stall speed of 28. Um, it was just a, a beautiful flying airplane. And of course, nothing beat uh, doing aerobatics at sunset uh, with your best girl in the airplane. And uh, uh, 5M that you see there on the rudder was my actual uh, SSA contest number, 5 Mike, uh, although I never uh, flew the Blonick in series competition. Uh, next step uh, in performance uh, is the uh, Pilatus B4 that you saw earlier. And uh, this is a beautiful Swiss all metal. Uh, uh, aerobatic uh, uh, sport uh, sailplane. Uh, the B4 had an L over D of 35 to one. Uh, about 300 were built, first flew in the mid 60s. And I love flying this airplane. Here's the cockpit and you can see it's just a beautiful layout. Um, I flew two of my silver badge flights in the B4. Uh, I did my altitude badge and, uh, and my endurance flight and the longest flight in a sailplane uh, in my logbook is in this uh, in this particular airplane, five hours and 20 minutes. Well, then we get to the next uh, next level, which is fiberglass. And you can see from this photo, uh, the uh, sleek fiberglass sailplane. Uh, now you're getting into serious competition and uh, really uh, outstanding uh, L over D up in the 40, even 50 range. And so let's take a look at the first generation of fiberglass airplanes. In the mid 60s, you had airplanes like the uh, German Lebel, uh, the Glassflugel uh, uh, airplane, the Glassflugel meaning glass bird. Uh, it's a small airplane, you kind of wear it. 
but uh, beautiful flying machine. And again, this kind of broke the, you know, into, broke the barriers into uh, sailplane construction and, and uh, just getting beautiful, sleek aerodynamic designs. Uh, you also had the German uh, Phoebus uh, made by the Balco company. Um, this is scanned from an old photo, so I'm sorry for the grain that you see there, but uh, uh, the Phoebus was a uh, uh, you know, standard class uh, airplane, standard class meaning 15 meter wingspan for competition. And the gentleman flying this uh, airplane is uh, Pete Reichert. He was uh, kind of the ace of the base there at, at uh, Elsinore for many years. And he flew this airplane from Lake Elsinore, uh, which is near San Diego, all the way out over the ocean to Catalina Island, probably covered about 45 miles of open ocean. And he had computed his uh, gliding distance and made the airport on the top of the mountain there at Catalina in the first try. He did not take a life raft with him. He was, uh, he was very confident and very excellent pilot. And then they, uh, we uh, arrow towed him back to Elsinore from that. But I always think of the Catalina flight when I look at, look at this photo. And then you have the open class sailplanes, which are uh, really long wingspans. Uh, and these are the serious competition and record setting airplanes. The, the Swiss Diamant or Diamond seen here at Elsinore uh, first flew in uh, 1964. And the pilot is flying it pretty much lying on his back. Uh, the canopy opens up by sliding forward and then the pilot uh, gets into the cockpit and, and closes the, the canopy above him. But uh, this was quite a machine and uh, really a thrill to see airplanes like this out at the field. The second generation, what I call the second generation uh, fiberglass airplanes are in the late 60s, early 70s. And here we have the uh, Schleicher ASW-15 standard class competition airplane. And look at the lines of this thing. It's just so elegant. And I'm sure it flew as, as good as it looked. And then you have the Ferrari of sailplanes, uh, literally, because this is the Italian Caproni A21. And believe it or not, this came as the A21J jet powered motor glider, or as they call it, self-launching sailplane. And uh, the Caproni uh, just turned heads everywhere it went. We had one at uh, Elsinore for a couple of years. Uh, L over D is 43 to one. Uh, it first flew in 1970. And what a stunning air, but it just looks like a, like a stealth jet. Uh, but it's a two-seater, side-by-side, high-performance Italian sailplane. And then from Poland, you have the PZL Yantar. This is the Yantar standard. And there was an open class as well. And uh, of all the glass ships that I've been privileged to fly, I think this is my favorite. It just it handled so beautifully. It was so docile uh, on the controls, and yet it uh, really gave you performance when you, uh, when you needed it. Uh, this photo was taken up at El Mirage Dry Lake. And the Yantar, uh, you can see the beautiful lines. Uh, of, the, of the sailplane. Well, you remember that uh, early uh, tow experience trying to learn how to get things together. And I thought I'd just spend a minute talking about the tow planes. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> um, but here we're towing in a Blahnik at Tehachapi, California behind a uh, Super Cub. And the Super Cub is an ideal tow plane, uh, 180 horse, uh, high wing, and uh, just a good utility airplane. And then they also have the uh, more powerful Piper Pawnee uh, agricultural aircraft uh, that are used as tow planes as well. And they really get up and scoot uh, when you need to. Uh, but the only thing better than having a super cub is having a super duper cub. And this is my drawing of what I envisioned as the ultimate tow plane. It had a radial engine stolen from the jump center, twin beach across the airport and racing slicks, uh, fuel tanks uh, and jet engines to help get the heavy, heavy airplanes off the ground, an ejection seat if a student pilot ever got out of position, and a uh, gunner's position up on top to take care of uh, customers who flew well past their assigned uh, rental times. This gentleman is Captain Phil Paul. Uh, Phil was a uh, a uh, Air Force flight test engineer in his earlier days and became a uh, pilot and captain for flying Tigers, flying DC-8s and eventually Boeing 747s. And uh, Phil, in partnership with uh, the gentleman you see in the back seat of this Blahnik, uh, Charlie Genish, uh, formed Aerosport, which was a company that imported Blahniks and a number of other uh, aircraft uh, for sale all over the Western United States. We uh, perfected a, a maneuver to deliver these airplanes uh, using a high altitude, high speed aero tow. And there you see Rick Johnson in the front seat. This is a two man operation because uh, the air loads at that speed were pretty significant. And Rick and I would take 30 minute shifts on these flights. 
but we delivered uh, sailplanes all over the Western US, literally flying to Arizona, Nevada, Utah. And um, what we did is once we uh, got out of controlled airspace in LA, uh, we uh, accelerated to 100 knots and climbed to 1,000 feet where there was still air, and then flew the long legs of the uh, delivery trips at, uh, at that altitude and speed. On this trip, we took a sailplane uh, up to Eugene, Oregon, uh, with an overnight stop, obviously. And here we are passing Mount Shasta on tow in uh, Blahnik. My second airplane uh, was based at Santa Inez uh, after the Elsinore flood. And uh, that's up near Santa Barbara, California, a very scenic place to fly. And as I said, I always took uh, friends for rides. Uh, these are members of the Society of Illustrators of LA who uh, would <laughs> literally sign up for reservations. They, we always had such a good time uh, up there flying and then we'd always go and have dinner afterward. But um, here you can see the spoilers on the sailplane wing. Uh, these deploy uh, when you're landing and this gives you precision control. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Uh, I co-owned this airplane with uh, the gentleman who's flying the uh, T-6 that you see there is a member of the Condor Squadron based out of Van Nuys, California. And uh, this is a formation you don't see too often. In the back seat of the airplane is my wife, Sherry. And I actually proposed to her in this airplane. I uh, took her for a glider ride, asked her to marry me and said, say yes or get out. 40 years later, so far so good. So here's one of my all time favorite photos, Blana coming in to land at San Inez, again, taken by a member of the Society of Illustrators. You see the spoilers deployed. And I wanna just spend a moment on this photo because the most often asked question that Rick or I ever got on a sailplane ride is, how do you know where you're gonna land? And I'd always have to say, this isn't a hot air balloon with all due respect to the balloon uh, folks out there. I said, this is, a, this is an airplane uh, that uses the uh, uh, you know, air currents to uh, propel itself and stay aloft. And it, it lands just like a regular airplane. The only thing is you can't go around. You have to do it right the first time. Uh, the X-15 did it that way 199 times without too many problems. And the shuttles did it 135 times without any problems. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, you, you kind of get the, the routine of it, but you only have the one wheel, which is really a, 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 an advantage in a crosswind. And you see the flaps deployed on the Blahnik and the spoilers are out. And it just gives you pin, pinpoint precision uh, to land the airplane uh, literally on a, you could, you, could, you could hit a pie plate if you wanted to. Uh, it's, it's, so we'd always uh, wow the passengers by putting the wheel on a chalk line on the runway and, and uh, You'd see the chalk fly out and, and uh, we'd prove the point that uh, uh, you land exactly where you want to in a glider. Uh, a different way of taking off is a winch launch. And this is Charlie Genish launching at Torrey Pines, California, down near San Diego. Uh, the little parachute you see there off to the left uh, is attached to the line and that lowers the uh, tow rope back down after the glider releases. But the winch launch is a, a large drum and, a, and a, a powerful engine that reels in the uh, tow rope and, and a, a glider uh, kites upward to oh, about 800 or even 1,000 feet and releases into uh, the ridge lift that you see here. This is Torrey Pines. The bluffs on the left uh, provide lift as the ocean wind comes in and uh, is deflected upward. And here you see the Blahnik uh, in solid lift going down the coast. And as I said, it's unusual to see airplanes out over the water, but uh, as long as the wind is blowing, you're going to be flying. And here's uh, from a different airplane. This is a Schweitzer 222 looking inland as a 126 passes by. Uh, that's UC San Diego off to the right. And uh, again, just you don't expect to see sailplanes out over the ocean. Uh, and in the event that uh, the wind does subside and you uh, can't get pattern altitude above the top of the cliff, uh, it's not a problem. You land the glider on the hard sand that you see down there below and they send a tow plane and uh, retrieve you and bring you back up to the airport. I actually did that in the 222. And I thought I'd close with some uh, beautiful locales that uh, you can fly sailplanes. Uh, I had a business trip to Europe in 1984 and uh, we flew at Loch Leven, Scotland, which was a stunning uh, glider port pristine uh, operation. And uh, here we see the German uh, ASK-13 two-seater and then its baby brother, the uh, KA-6. But uh, just really impressive. We flew late in the afternoon. You can see the lighting there and did aerobatics. It was just a beautiful, uh, beautiful venue. And then uh, for mountain flying, it doesn't get much better than the Swiss Alps. 
And here we see a Swiss uh, Pilatus B4 in its home environment. And speaking of mountains, I'll give you a sneak peek at another episode we're going to be doing uh, shortly, and that's uh, Mountain Wave. Uh, here you're looking at the Owens Valley, and that's the Sierra Wave in full action. You see the uh, glider wingtip. This photo was taken from about 38 or 39,000 feet. And uh, of course, we're on oxygen here. But um, uh, we're going to talk about this, this Sierra Wave project in the 50s and the discovery of this wave that went to 60,000 feet and the establishment of a number of world records, including uh, still the current world sailplane altitude record for single seat sailplanes, which is 49,000 feet. Well, there you have it. A look at uh, vintage gliders in the golden age of soaring. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you again for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. As always, special thanks to way too many people to list here, but uh, just the good folks at Skylark Gliderport at Lake Elsinore, Skylark North at Tehachapi, and Aerosport at Long Beach, and later at uh, Lake Elsinore as well. So again, thank you, and until next time, take care.